Hey, everyone, you are listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast. We are two neurodivergent mental health professionals in a neurotypical world. I'm Patrick Cassell. And I'm Dr. Neff. And during these episodes, we do talk about sensitive subjects, mental health, and there are some conversations that can certainly feel a bit overwhelming. So we do just want to use that disclosure and disclaimer before jumping in. And thanks for listening. As autistic ADHD business owners, Patrick and I both understand the importance of promotion and doing it in a way that feels authentic and genuine. If you are a neurodivergent business owner and you would like to place your services or products in front of a neurodivergent audience, we are now opening up our podcast for sponsorships and we're providing a 10% discount code for neurodivergent business owners. So if you are an autistic or ADHD business owner, and you'd like to get in front of our audience, reach out to Divergent Conversations Podcast at gmail.com for more information. And now we are going to take a quick break to thank our sponsors. Workplace communication can be messy. Considering the lens of neurodiversity can be helpful for understanding this. Maybe you found yourself frustratedly typing per my last email in an office communication, perplexed about how a colleague or client doesn't seem to understand your very clearly written email. Consider this. Visual information processing isn't everyone's strength. Perhaps a quick call can make a world of difference. Or how about including a video or voice message with your email? And this technology exists. Simple steps like these can make your work environment more accessible and bring out the best in everyone. Tula Consulting is on a mission to help organizations build more neuro-inclusive products and work environments. Tula does this by bringing curious minds to solve curious problems. Find out more by visiting tulaneurodiversity.org. That's T-U-L-A, neurodiversity.org. Thanks for hanging around, and now we're jumping back in. Well, welcome back to segment three of our Ask a Neurotype series. Um, We have Amanda here for Ask an Autistic, which I'm so excited about. Um, First, just huge disclaimer, we are asking one person about their experience of their neurotype. That is not a global statement on everyone's experience. Um, So with that, I'm really excited to introduce you to Amanda. Amanda and I have worked on a few projects together. She just released a fantastic book, Low Demand Parenting. And she's really active in the neurodivergent affirming parenting world, especially for PDAers or anyone wanting to learn how to parent in a low demand way. Amanda, do I feel like I captured that right? Yeah. Or what would you like to add? I should say. Um, I am a mom of three neurodivergent kids, um, and I discovered that I was autistic some point in my 37th year. So um, I gave myself my autism, the like official diagnostic experience was my 38th birthday present to myself. Oh my goodness. Wait, I love, like you went for an assessment on your birthday? It was two days before. I love my that. Yeah. I love my that birthday so is on a holiday. <laughs> Did you make like a cake, like happy birthday, I'm autistic? Because that would have been amazing. Um, The truth is that I was super ready for the assessment. I had self-identified for months and gone through a full diagnostic process for one of my kids where I was like, check, check, check of all the boxes, but it's still getting the official diagnosis sent me into about a two week swirl brain cloud where I wasn't really very present or celebratory. I was just Mm. communing with the younger parts of myself and um, Mm. feeling a lot of self-compassion and and grief. So I Mm. think the cake part came um, about three weeks after the the diagnosis when I was ready to say, hello world, I'm autistic. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so much I love about what you just said. And my brain's first you in so many ways. Like one, um, just the combination of of grief and liberation and how that is such a common experience. I also love how you dropped parts work in there, which Patrick talks about all the time. I think it is so healing, especially in that discovery process. Um, 
Yeah, I was also 37. I feel like I keep seeing, maybe it's like confirmation bias, but I feel like I see 37 pop up a lot as a time of identification. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, part of your claim to fame beyond your book and your awesome resources is that you're the only autistic person in your family that's not also ADHD. Do I have that right? Yes. 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 And um, some of my family members are are very ADHD forward. Like that's kind of Mm -hmm. the leading edge of how they move through the world. So I feel like not being ADHD in a way is a big part of what kept my wider family from knowing I was neurodivergent is because they were like, well, clearly you don't struggle because Mm -hmm. we are all struggling and you are over there just fine. And Mm -hmm. it made it harder for, um, for some of the places that I really struggle, like um, some of the social communication and Mm -hmm. um, the intense inward feeling of not ever fitting in anywhere that Mm -hmm. some members of my family didn't struggle with quite as intensively. I think in some ways the ADHD kind of gave them, I don't know, some sort of uh, some social superpowers that I didn't have, but that that was not as evident in the family dynamic um, because it seemed like I didn't have any trouble following through when I said I was going to do something. Um, I was incredibly detail oriented. I never lost the thread in a conversation. Um, and those were many of the the, the biggest skill gaps mm-hmm. that the people around me were struggling with. So they were like, man, Amanda, she's as neurotypical as they come. Like, no, nope, just so not int- ADHD. Well, that's so interesting because w- what you're describing is intact executive functioning. And so how with that, the autism could go missed. I just want to jump in real quick though, Amanda, because that's kind of what my experience was like too. Although I am autistic ADHD, I think autistic parts are much more pronounced and I it gets missed a lot. And I just remember like feeling like exactly what you said, that intense loneliness, disconnection, and socially especially is what really led to me seeking out my diagnosis in terms of being 35 again diagnosis at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And it's sometimes people talk about like not having the rule book to other people, feeling mm-hmm. like the the key to unlocking connection was always missing unless I contorted and chameleoned and performed like became mm-hmm. somebody else. And that I I could, it felt like there were always one, it was one option or the other. It was authenticity and loneliness, or it was connection and betrayal of self. And that mm-hmm. both hurt so excruciatingly that um, I ended up choosing connection and betrayal of self because it felt like it was the safer way. Of course, it was very reinforced by the world around mm-hmm. me. Um, masked Amanda was very well liked. And so... Um, when I, but the hard part is that the lonely, authentic part of me, um, doesn't go anywhere. She just hangs out inside. Like no one really likes me. No one really sees me. No one really wants me that you ultimately can't betray yourself because wherever we go, there we are. And, um, so it was, um, you know, intact executive functioning in some ways made me a really strong masker because I was very, very perceptive, um, and, and making some pretty clear cognitive loops between what other people were saying and wanting from me and then how I performed. Mm -hmm. Um, I sometimes envied family members who seemed like they were like, well, I am who I am, you know, take me or leave Mm me. I was Mm -hmm. like, I didn't never have that power. It was, Take me, take me, please. Mm-hmm. I'll do anything. Yeah, yeah. That internal experience feels so, I've said, like, feels so torturous, like, internally, like, this push-pull tug of war. I'm like, where do I belong? How do I show up as my true self? Do I even understand my true self? Why do I feel so disconnected? Why do I feel so lonely and isolated, even when I'm around people um, who care about me, air quotes? Uh, and I, I, I just commend you for just, you know, working through that experience and naming that too. And I think for me, I've said it many times in this podcast, like the grief relief process of like 
diagnosis was grief inducing for sure. And it was also majorly relieving in a lot of ways after I processed the grief and, and some of my own internal experiences. Yeah. I feel, I feel so free. I, over and over again in my life, I've had people who love me really well help me to name this reality with some metaphors that have been really powerful. Um, I'm an ordained Presbyterian pastor. And when I stepped down from pastoring, um, I knew it, it was, this was years before my diagnosis, but I knew that this work that we're outlining was, was the path ahead for me and that it was too hard for me to be a pastor and figure out who I wanted to be in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I had come up with the metaphor of myself feeling like I was a turtle, that mm -hmm. I, the, all the soft, tender parts of me were very small and very hidden. And the shell, the big, strong, capable back was like, displayed for all to see. And there were all these people all over my show. And I was just dragging them along with me. And that I was dreaming of being a turtle without people all over my show. Mm -hmm. And then this dear friend and colleague pulled me aside and said, Amanda, you're not a turtle. You're mm -hmm. a flipping bird. And that, I, that was like my first glimmer of being autistic. It's like, mm. I'm not even a turtle. It's not that I've got so many people on my shell and that I'm so tired. It's that I, I'm, in, I'm the wrong creature altogether. Mm. And that, um, gosh, becoming the bird has been, because mm. a bird like soars and a bird has agency and a bird has, mm. can be like alone and in a flock and um, just like the isolated, tired turtle dragging the people across the street is like mm. all of my old self mm. and the the freedom is being the bird it's a beautiful metaphor i love that mm. yeah i was gonna ask and based on that i think the answer is yes first of all i love the kind of this or that scenario that you that you drew out of like either i think it was authenticity and um, loneliness, loneliness or connection and betrayal. Was that it? That captures it. I think so profoundly. And I was going to ask if since, since diagnosis and discovery, have you found a third way? One thing is that I've discovered how much I enjoy being alone. Mm -hmm. So I have recovered loneliness, that loneliness is actually still bound up in ableism. It's mm -hmm. still saying there's something wrong with this emotional experience or something scary. And mm -hmm. um, I, I've i discovered how little social interaction I need in order to feel whole and thriving. It is Same. remarkably little. Yep. <laughs> and that that doesn't then make me in the, like a loner a uh, social misfit, uh, like all of these labels that are put on people who really just have a very small need for social interaction. Yeah. That, that, that it fills me all the way up. I'm all yeah. full. Yeah. And I feel so good. And yeah. I really only need one friend that I yeah. see every couple of weeks for a short period of time, relatively. Yeah. But yeah. I, I love that. About that. So my third way is like, um, maybe it's a, a healing and a recovery of that earlier self. It's not necessarily, um, I guess it is a third way. It, it's saying loneliness um, is really not loneliness. It's being honest about what fills me up and then choosing those things wholeheartedly hmm. without label or judgment. And then recognizing that being full of myself is actually how I feel most connected to the world. Mm. That my primary connection to me is actually what makes me feel so vibrantly alive. And that connection to other is quite secondary for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just, I have to say that, that my family has become a really crucial middle space there, the more that I unmask 
and that I feel truly free and cozy and nestled and comfortable in my immediate family dynamic, like with my children, with my husband, mm-hmm. um, that I'm, I'm experiencing really for the first time what it feels like to be in a flock, um, mm-hmm. that I've kept myself lonely, even within my most intimate connections for yeah. in the before times as well. Yeah. Um, so even with the people I trust the most, I still am holding back so much of myself. I'm still being very secretive with my, with my true self. And so laying aside those old mm-hmm. patterns of protection and choosing to trust the people who have earned it, um, mm-hmm. is also a big piece of what makes me feel whole and connected yeah. to myself and others at the same time. It's, it's the same work. Well, and yeah, those are so reciprocal, right? Like I actually talk to people about this a lot of, we could be going through the motions of connecting to others, but unless we're connected with ourself, we're not actually going to feel deeply connected to others. And so, so I hear the both end of that in taking the space you need to connect to yourself. It also has allowed you to show up kind of often authentically in your core relationships to where you're also feeling deeper connections. I I've, experienced a very similar experience, especially with my nuclear family. Um, and I, like, I was relating so hard to everything you're saying about like being alone and giving myself permission to be okay, not being social. Like, so on the SRS, it's one of the autism measures. There's a scale for social motivation. And if it's really elevated, it means you have very little. Mine is very, very elevated. It was the most elevated out of my scales. And for so long, I over. I overrode that instinct um, because of all the shoulds, like I should be social, a X, Y, Z and realizing, yeah, I love connecting with ideas through books and through taking in information. And I love being creative and being able to actually think through, do I want to go to this event? Like it sounds so simple, but it's actually quite radical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's made a big difference in our family life for me to be really honest about this because I do opt out of a lot of things that I was participating in before, um, but it's actually really freeing because a number of my children don't want to go to various things too. And so it becomes very aligned that my partner, my husband is neurotypical with a really strong love for kind of like busy social environments. Um, He's a social butterfly, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. And so you know, if there's a soccer game where I know there's going to be a ton of sideline conversations and interruptions and, um, and some kids want to stay home, like in the old times, we would have done a pretty detailed dance around who's going to do what. And now it's like, can I please stay home? I would love to stay home. And he's like, okay, awesome. Cause I really want to go. And it's so easy. It's just like what we want to do. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and same with birthday parties. We we live in an intentional community. So we have a lot of big community events, which my heart is with everything that we're about, but I don't actually love going to most of my birthday events, but my husband does. So it's just made it so easy. So I get all of this cozy alone time with mm-hmm. my more introverted or maybe somebody who's kind of a little anxious about that gathering, or it's just not their thing then they always know they can stay home with me and we're all getting our needs met. I I used to think that I can't like not only the shoulds, but um, some, some shame that I didn't really want to go. And so I would override it in part because I didn't want to face my own shame. Yeah. And go ahead. I jump in. Um, Yeah. And I don't want to derail us too much into like, mom and parenting, but I think especially, you know, we're both in kind of heteronormative structured marriages. There's a lot of social pressure for the moms to be the ones to take the kids to the events. And same thing in my family since discovery, Uh, my husband is introverted, um, but he has so much more tolerance for socializing than I do. So we've, we've shifted, we've defaulted to where he takes the kids or similarly, like one of my kids really loves the movie theater one doesn't I cannot handle movie theaters so I'm always I'm the designated I'll stay home with the kid and it works really well and I also love how it pushes against a lot of the narrative of what a mom should be um because there's so much pressure for us to be the 
designated social parent. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm in the homeschooling world also where that is like times 10. Yes. That is for your world. uh, (laughs) Opting out um, or saying, you know, one person can come over. I would love for one person and one kid to come over, but we, we can't do a a co-op. We can't do, you know, a gathering. I can't turn something like my home that feels super safe into something that feels chaotic. It needs Mm -hmm. to, um, it needs to meet my needs too. And that's been so much easier to do as I've become more honest with myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can we ask you some questions that we've been asking everyone kind of about their neurotype experience as our Little compare contrast. Sure. Let's do it. You can start us off with whatever you got. I noticed you unmuted, so I thought maybe. Um, Well, first, I feel like you've started talking about this, but can you tell us a little bit more, like, what is your experience of small talk and kind of socializing, I guess, in general? I experience small talk, especially in an environment where there are multiple small talk conversations happening all at the same time. It feels to me like being in a rushing river. Mm. It feels like I will drown Hmm. here and that my first mode um, is actually to try to, to dissociate in order to float. I imagine myself, I'm like thrashing and kicking, trying to participate in this moment. And instead I kind of like go under and put my head back and I drown out the sound. It's like, it all turns into like, like when you put your head under the water and I'm just like, just make it just, just stay it, just stay right here. Um, I'm, I'm remembering, imagining myself one of the last parties that I went to a while back. Um, and I usually cling pretty tightly to my partner in these environments because, um, because of that drowning feeling, it's like, you're the only person here that I feel like, um, I can anchor to. And, um, he went inside to do something. And so I was out all by myself and I just, I feel so acutely aware of my body. Uh, like I don't, I I turn into like a, like a reptile or something like that. Um, and I, I sort of start to slowly move away from the conversation that I'm a part of. Like maybe if I just like take tiny steps away, I can extricate myself from this. And so I eventually went and sat and there was like a bunch of people chatting and uh, there was one table. Um, and it, I went and sat at the table by myself and just ate. I just like mm. shoveled food. And um, my husband came and found me later and he was like, do you need saving? And I was like, no, I'm okay. Um, And he said, well, there's a person over there that has, is interested. I think they study autism and medical care or something like that. And like, do you want me to introduce you? And I was like, yes, that would be great. And so then um, he kind of like found me a person that I could special interest with and um, I said, do you mind if we move to this corner of the yard? And we had like a deep dive conversation mm-hmm. separate from other people. And I was able to really enjoy that. Um, but it's so acutely different. The like I'm, um, it's the, it's a kind of a panic reaction too, yeah. in terms of what my neurology, my, my physiology is, is communicating. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that both of my, both parts of my nervous system are, are hitting the heart, hitting it hard. And what I think is so um, confusing and always has been confusing for me is that when I disconnect from my genuine self, like if I completely disconnect from my body, I'm actually really good. I can, I can fake. And I don't know how fake it is. It's just, I can, I can perform small talk really well where the other person would never know how hard I am working and the cost. And so I didn't know because I kept that the reality of the experience I was having way under lock and key. But of course, like many people, you know, it just came out in all these other ways. Like, why am I so chronically anxious? Why am I depressed? Why can't I accomplish the things that I want to in life? Um, And it was kind of all bound up in this 
chronically, extremely stressful social situation that I kept putting myself into as a pastor. I did. I was thinking about that. I was like, you were a pastor. There's a lot of small talk that goes into that. Yeah. So much. And sometimes I was able to quickly steer it into deep talk, but usually I was suppressing just how intense the embodied experiences that I was having. I actually want to ask you about that. That's a good um, segue as well, is during small talk, right? When you're noticing these experiences now, maybe not in those moments beforehand, what are you experiencing behind the scenes when you're feeling like trapped in terms of like, are we mimicking gestures? Are we mimicking body language? Are we nodding our head a lot? Like how is eye contact as well? Because I notice for me, when I'm in a masked state, I have, I feel this need to like, nod my head a lot and validate and socially reinforce and like make more eye contact, even though it's unbelievably uncomfortable for me, instead of being able to just look away or look down or look to the side. And what I'm experiencing internally is like this constriction feeling of like, how the hell do I get out of this? And I do a lot of, I won't call them Irish goodbyes anymore, but I'll call them autistic goodbyes maybe, but I definitely don't do a good job of it. Like if I want to get out of the conversation, I do not do a good job of like saying like, Hey, I'm going to leave. Goodbye. I'm just like, (laughs) I'm getting getting out of here. And I just pack away. I do the same thing. My goodbyes are one of, I think that's like a clear place that I've never been able to mask. Um, I have always done something where I'll like, make it clear. It looks like I'm going to the bathroom. We're like, oh, I got a call. And then I just leave instead. Yep, I still do too. that all me the time. Uh, all the time. like wrap up all a conversation. Time. I mean, every week on this podcast, I'm like, Patrick, you do. I actually was just having an anxious moment. Patrick might hop off early today. And I was like, oh shit, am I going to have to say the goodbye? And I was starting to script like, what, what does he say every week? Like, why are goodbyes so hard? It's so true. And I do the same thing, Amanda. Like, I will pretend I have a phone call. I'm like, oh, hey. And I like put it to my ear and I'm like, I just walk away. And then I just put the phone in my pocket. Like, it's clearly not illuminated. Clearly nobody is calling me. There's no voice coming out of the other side, but I have to get out of there. And when I have to get out of there, I have to go immediately. Like, it has to be like that. It cannot be like a long drawn out process. Oh, long drawn out goodbyes are so awkward because you like keep summarizing, like, have a good week, have a good week good to talk to you good to talk to you bye bye it's like what what is the closing yeah you get caught in this loop of like consist continuously saying the same thing over and over hoping for that like exit point and then you can't find it so you have to like force the issue and my face will just shift completely like it'll be like looking for the exit very dramatically and like i don't know how to get out of this situation right now wow yes um, well, the only thing I would add to all of this around like what's happening in my body when I'm masking really heavily is um, I I get increasingly rigid in my body. So I start to lock my knees, then I'm flexing my thighs, then I, my hands are starting to turn into little grippy balls. Um, then I start clenching my jaw. It's like my whole body is freezing up. And I often lock on eye contact, um, which people have always commented, like, I'm such a good listener. Um, But I never look away. I am like, zeroed in. And that's how I um, like the looking away and knowing when to look like I can't do that. Mm -hmm. If I'm really going to be in touch with myself, any kind of truly difficult question, like, what do you want for dinner? I have to close my eyes. I feel like, like there are like any difficult me. questions, like, what do you want for dinner? Because that's so true. Yes. Um, like, if you guys ask me, like, a, you'll, you'll know it's a hard one when I'm, like, have to close my eyes. Like, there's just no way for me to know what I think unless I shut out the visual stimulation. You did that just a minute ago when I asked you about small talk. You took a moment. You shut your eyes. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. It's a need. And yet it's one that I have overridden with this intense mm-hmm. eye contact. And now we are going to take a quick break to thank our sponsors. We would love to thank Marissa Lapiana, Psychotherapy, for sponsoring this episode. Marissa, she, they. 
is a neuroqueer licensed clinical social worker and trauma therapist. They bring a queer and neurodivergent affirming anti-ableist lens to their practice. She is passionate about utilizing attachment-focused EMDR work, parts work, and body-based somatic work to support folks with trauma healing. They are also deeply influenced and inspired by the inherent strengths, resilience, and wisdom of queer, disabled, and neurodivergent communities. Marissa offers both individual therapy as well as workshops and trainings. If you reside in the state of California and you're looking for a queer, neurodivergent, affirming therapist, you can schedule a free consultation at marissalapianalcsw.com. That is M-A-R-I-S-A-L-A-P-I-N-A-L-C-S-W.com. All of that information will be in the show notes so that you have easy access to her information. Thanks for hanging around. And now we're jumping back in. Is there any other autistic specific questions, Patrick, you want to ask before I hop on the like ADHD versus autism questions? Um, I always like to know. We Socializing is always the big one. I like to always know about like transitions and, and like changes unexpectedly and abruptly how, how those feel or, or experience. Um, I also think about like food consistencies, textures, things like, like that, sensory. but ultimately... Yeah. Special interests, um, all of those questions are things that come to mind, but I am happy to assess out the two between ADHD and autism as well. Well, those are great questions. Amanda, you just heard a bunch, basically, yeah, all the autism criteria, special interests, sensory stuff, routine disruptions, yeah. um, which with a family full of ADHD, I would think you'd have a bit of, like, are there any of those that are grabbing your attention of like, oh yeah, I want to talk about that? I've always had an uneasy relationship with routine. Hmm. I always craved it as a young person, and I would generate a lot of very rigid routines. Um, but in a family of ADHDers, it was really difficult for us to ever stick to any of them. And so I created a idolized persona of myself where I am very hmm. consistent and routine driven. And then as I've grown into myself as an actual adult and not the fictional adult I thought I wanted when I was a kid, um, it turns out that I actually much prefer to have free and open time where I can move through it without a sense of how it is supposed to be, hmm. that actually scripting my own day and following a regimented order is more of a stress uh, uh, what do they say that the autism criteria are actually autism stress behaviors? Like, I think that yeah. that is actually a stress behavior for me and not actually a safety and flow need. Mm -hmm. Um, and that if there are too many things expected of me, then I need a, that produces stress. And then I get very regimented on how I will do all of those things. But when I do what I do, which is drop all those demands release the expectations and do the proactive and deep work around restoring um, a sense of flow in life that actually works for me. Very few externally driven routines. Um, I'm very much in tune with like, ooh, ooh, what do I feel like doing right now? What might feel good to my body? Hmm. Um, and that, but I think in a way, because I'm not ADHD, just kind of gets here, but I don't lose, I don't have quite the same sense of time blindness like I don't lose myself um in quite the same way and so I feel like I'm able to follow the flow without it completely derailing like the th the things that I want to do with my day like I can hold the kind of loose agenda and follow my flow and feel like it'll probably all get done like that's a thing that I can have confidence in which I think and I've never been autistic and ADHD but I think it's hard to feel that sense in yourself. Like I can do these things if I just follow my flow. That's so interesting. Cause I, I've always thought of this as hyperfixation, but maybe it's more hyperfocus. I, I have a hard time kind of, I'll create a structure for my day or a to-do list, but then what will often happen is I'll end up spending like eight hours deep in a workbook when I like set out to be like, I'm going to do three hours of admin email, like charting, but then I'll get into a project, get really focused. The day has gone by and I have no inertia to go do the boring things. Um, but does that, that happens to you less? Like if you're like, I'm going to do these things today, you just do them. <laughs> um, I 
only, so like, yes and no. Um, I can only do three things in a day Mm -hmm. and sometimes more. And it depends on if they're hard things. Like if I have to call and make a doctor's appointment, it's one thing on the, it's just one. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's it. Um, or, uh, yeah, it is. And, um, I know a lot of people talk about like, (laughs) you kind of sit around waiting for five hours and then you do the thing and then you decompress (laughs) for another four hours. Like that is actually my real life. I am spending a lot of that time, you know, with my children and, um, it's not empty time, but, um, but I will only do one hard thing a day. (laughs) And I think that's in one of the ways that I like I am autistic in that um, my sometimes my capacity for for those challenges is is pretty limited, but I but I can find a time in my day when I will want to do it. Like mm-hmm. that's how I feel about daily tasks. Like not every day do I find a time where I want to wash the dishes, but almost every day at some point I want to do it. But if I say I always do it first thing in the morning when I wake up and then I don't want to do it at that time, that can really throw me off. So Mm -hmm. I'll just say, Mm -hmm. like, pay attention to yourself. When do you want to do it? When is it the right match for energy? I love Um, that. I do a ton of that of like, I have tasks, but then I pair it to my energy because my energy is all over the place. Sometimes it's physical energy. Sometimes it's cognitive energy. And so that's been probably one of the biggest accommodations or the best accommodations I've given myself is to create enough space in my life where the tasks can pretty much pair with the energy. Um, and I, and I love that back before, like that was, that created a lot of strain and stress in my body when I was like doing a task that was in conflict with the energy I had. Yeah, I agree with that. And, um, a lot of times I would be doing it out of somebody is putting a lot of pressure on me to do the thing. Uh, like you really need to do this. You really need to do this. And that just increases my stress and resistance to doing the thing. Absolutely. And um, so if I feel a lot of stress, like, well, recently I, um, I got a computer a while back and I really needed to get Apple care on it because we have so much issues with broken technology around here. And um the harder my husband reminded me to do it, the less likely I was to do it. And guess what? I never did it. And (laughs) then it got broken and he was like, did you do it? Like, I really wanted you to. And it's like, I know I didn't, I really didn't. And, and then I felt really terrible. Um, cause like he tried his very hardest to get me to do it. And, and I, and I started to like, maybe I don't deserve a new computer. You know, this was my fault. And I really appreciated the way that he, that my husband pivoted. Maybe this is a good example of what it looks like for the people in our lives to be accommodating. So he was like, you know, it's okay. Like, this is one of the costs of having a disability that people yeah. don't see and it's okay. Yeah. You couldn't do it. And next time we'll put it in my name so that I can do it for you. That asking mm-hmm. you to do it was too much. Um, cause sometimes I can tell right away that task is not like at some point my, my energy is going to match this task. Like my energy will never match this task. Yeah. That's how it was for me with the Apple care. Like I was never going to yeah. get it done. Yeah. First of all, I just, I love that as a response from, from your husband. That's really beautiful. Um, I, I've mentioned similar stories with my husband where things that, yeah, are expensive that I like start having so much shame about where he stepped in and be like, you know what? That's part of your brain. You also like use your creativity in your brain to bring in income. And there's like, like I actually, I had the other day, I realized a pretty significant oversight that costs my business quite a bit of money. And I, you know how you've seen the, I don't know if you've seen those reels of like the ADHD tax for personal life. I was like, oh my gosh, if I applied the ADHD tax for my business, it is sub substantive. <laughs> um, just be, yeah, these, and this is, again, this is, part of our brains, it's going to happen. Um, but that's actually pivoting me to a question I wanted to ask you, which is around the interest-based nervous system. Cause I, I've gone back and forth on putting that in the middle of my Venn diagram between ADHD and autism. But part of what I heard in that was it was hard for you to get yourself to start that task. Um, I'm curious, does the interest-based nervous system, so that idea that if it's outside of an area, 
of interest or urgency or novelty that it's really hard to get started. Does that resonate with your experience? Let's say those things one more time. I just need to interest, urgency, novelty. Um, the, uh, the category I would put on there it, that you didn't mention is like love or service. Like I that literally, is what enables me to do that. This is my theory. Well, actually my theory is much colder than you. My theory was that if you add duty to it, then that's the autistic experience that duty, but I love how you put it in more relational terms of service and that that is very motivating for autistic people. So that's so funny that that was exactly the theory I was working with. Yeah. Yeah. I've been my, my oldest, um, is autistic and needs like cleanliness in mm -hmm. a certain type of cleanliness. It's a really high bar for him. Um, but it's really difficult for me to execute, um, with our family structure. And so the only thing that gets me over the hump to do it is I think about how much I love him and how much mm -hmm. he needs this and then I can do it. Hmm. I don't need novelty. I don't need, I, it, actually, some of those things hurt me. Urgency really was, hurts me. What? That was my other, I was kind of, that was my hypothesis was I think autistic people are probably more prone to kind of get paralysis amidst urgency. I see that, the pressure, whereas for an ADHD system, it's like, okay, let's go. Um, so that was another one of my kind of theories around that was that urgency would actually backfire. Yeah. Yeah. yeah interest is always going to be, you know, the yes. way in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I put that at the center of the diagram. <laughs> so you would say like interest and then like relational care service would be two drivers. If it's outside of those two, is it hard to get yourself started or on a task? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much everything else is hard to get started yeah. on. Yeah. 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 If it's not an area of special interest or it is not in service of someone I love, that's pretty much everything I don't do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of special interests, what special interests do you have or have you noticed over the years? Someone, um, a friend of mine, where we're kind of kicking around things about our neurotype um, lately. And she said, is it okay to say that I think I'm my own special interest? And I was like, I think it's okay <laughs> to say that. <laughs> so interesting. Um, that really struck a chord with me. I think that deep introspective work about me, like I have always been one of my own favorite subjects. Um, mm -hmm. I am the easiest thing for me to talk about. Uh, it's part of the reason that I have really enjoyed podcasting is that it takes away the obvious 50-50 reciprocity of most conversations. And it's like, I'm expected to talk about myself 90% of the time. And that feels so easy. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, my children um, have been a special interest for me since they were born. Um, I am, um, I got really hyper-focused on um, understanding autism for a season when that was um, my number one special interest in parenting. Um, parenting with radical acceptance at the center is, is the other thing. And I pretty much think about all those things all the time. My kind of less known special interests are um, Disney World is one. Um, I'm wild about Disney World. Um, and uh, when we were talking about connection, um, like fiction, reading historical fiction about women, um, especially if it's like fantasy historical fiction about like ancient witches and stuff like that, like that is 100% my jam. And nice. so I get a lot of connection from like the the ancestors um, and and sort of a sense of like alternate identity. Like if I'd been born in another time and place, like who I would have been. I can relate so hard to that. <laughs> like so hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I got to jump off of here, but y'all are going to continue the combo. So. I appreciate meeting you and, and having you on for this. I just wanted to say that before I get out of here. Thank you. Thank you. As much as I hate saying goodbyes. So goodbye. See you, Megan. Let's go. <laughs> um, I love how you made a business out of your special interest. That's something Patrick and I have both also done. And I think it's, I don't think I could run a business or 
really do work outside of my interest because it would be so, so hard. So, yeah, I've never even fathomed it really. Um, I think it's always felt so utterly impossible. And when I was a pastor and, um, well, before I was a pastor, I, th I think that my sense of inability to get like a job mm -hmm. and how deeply I've known that and how long I've known that is another piece of this like self-knowledge that has always been really clear. Like I have absolutely never been able to imagine myself um, doing almost every job I see other people doing. Um, and, and really any job that's handed to me, because I, it has to be my unique yes. view of the world in yes. order for it to be a fit. So even though I was completely consumed and, um, engrossed in theology and church history and social mm -hmm. action and, um, the way that we can like corporately represent our values in the world, I was like, I could never serve a church because, I mean, I could never be a part of a system like that. Yep, uh, I've never been able to participate in a system. One of the ways that I compensate or, or work around that is that I, I always am the leader of everything that I'm a part mm -hmm. of. And then I infuse it with my interests. So that was one of the reasons it was hard for me to see myself as autistic is I like, I'm pretty good at leading groups or creating groups. But then I realized that, especially when I went through my doctoral training, I realized I didn't, I had a hard time developing friends within my cohort, but what I became was like, uh, my supervisor or mentor called me like the TA extraordinaire. Like I would TA all the classes, I would lead groups and I could mentor people. And again, that's not a reciprocal relationship. Therapy is not a reciprocal conversation. Um, I mean, to some degree. And so I was found myself in these roles where I could like kind of hide the reciprocal aspects that were harder for me. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I also, I also did seminary. We've talked about that and um, theology was a special interest of mine for a long time. And I thought I was going to become like a Hebrew scholar was my, was my first school, which would have worked well, right? That's reading and research and writing and teaching, which is not, again, not very reciprocal. Um, but yeah, church would have been hard for me too. Yeah. I've, I've also gravitated to those kind of roles where I'm in deep connection with others, but where I'm playing a specific role in their life that I find it easier to be, um, you know, again, to use the parts work, like I'm choosing only one part and occupying that, but like being the fullness of me is harder. And so yep. I can be, um, I could be teacher, Amanda, or I can be sort of pseudo therapist, Amanda. Um, but all of those are, are pretty narrow slices of, yeah. of me and that that's what enables me and, and they're non-reciprocal relationships. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Usually where I'm in a giving role. Um, although yes. I can sometimes flip it where I'm in the, the exclusive teaching role. I'm also it's right. When you're, when you're teaching or you're coaching or you're on a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually one of the reasons I think a lot of people that go unidentified is like when we're in the helping role, it's still a non-reciprocal conversation, but people aren't expressing concern about that. And so, it, you know, we go under the radar that under the autism radar. Yeah, exactly. People like a good helper and a good listener. Yep. It's very reinforced as well. It, and so yes. you become more and more that role as people are like, wow, this is you. You're just so this. And you're like, oh, this must be me. This is just so, but it's really a very, very small. Well, and that, that gets so complex, right? Because that becomes, I think for a lot of us, I know for me, a part of our core identity, because it's so reinforced that then to unmask all for me meant to give up this part of my identity had been so reinforced and valued that that's its own complex process of giving up that, um, accommodating. Right. Yeah. Especially yeah. when the identity that came before it largely for me when I was younger and before I took on that role so very, very fully was like, you're too much. You're so mm -hmm. picky. And yep. So I was like, Oh, okay. Then I'll become super flexible and the nicest yep. person you've ever met. <laughs> everybody liked that version of me much better. Yes. And the first one was actually much truer. And so that yeah. also makes unmasking feel extra risky. 
Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask one more, maybe two more ADHD questions, and then I want to be cognizant of your time as well. Um, Okay. I just did a deep dive on RSD, rejection sensitive dysphoria. And the the research really comes out of the ADHD research. Um, It's also common among autistic people, but it's unclear if that's because of co-occurring ADHD or if it's just a shared experience. So, and again, to summarize, RSD is kind of like an intense response to any perceived rejection or criticism. A lot of people with RSD describe it as like a physical, like we'll have a physical pain, like a gut punch or kind of chest pain. Um, Is that part of your experience? I've I've actually thought about this a lot. So um, (laughs) as with the things I've thought about a lot, it's like I could tell you 20 minutes of things about it, but I'm not sure how to summarize. (laughs) Um, I think from sitting with this question, I do not experience it very often. (laughs) I have experienced it enough that when you say those words, I can feel the echo of sensation in my body. Like I have felt that, but I don't think it's a very, it's not a common experience for me. And I think that it's possible that because of that, the mechanism that's leading to it is different than for people with RSD. Okay. So like, I'm, I'm going to bring it into practical. We're both on social media. I'm at a point where like, every time I open the app, I have a stomach ache. Like I, I actually struggle to open the app um, because of like, if there's a negative comment on a post, I will think about that all day. And it might even carry over to the next day. Um, like last week, I had a Venn diagram that there there was a lot of um d- dislike of the Venn diagram I put up. And I like that ruined my day. And I hated that it ruined my day. And then I like hated that I hated that it, you know, those spiraling emotions. You're on social media. You also, I imagine that some of your posts don't get all love because these are controversial topics. Um, when you have a negative comment, what is that experience like for you? Hmm. Um, my primary emotion is shame and hide and never show up again. I want to okay. withdraw yeah, really. and treat. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so one of the, one of the things that feels good to me in that is, um, I have like a little thing that I say to myself, I say, I'm just a mom in North Carolina. It's like, oh, I, I try to remember, I'm like, I'm just... I'm just another yeah. human. Yeah. And it it's a way that I also remind myself that I don't have to be anything. Like my identity is not what's out there in the world being judged. Like that resides with me and me only. And um, and also just like a little like I can always quit. Like I can always just stop being low demand Amanda and just be a mom in North Carolina. Like <laughs> oh, I'm not stuck. Um Sometimes I will get into like a pretty lengthy argument with the person inside of my head. Um, yep, yep. I don't love that because I'm giving them a lot of real estate in my head yes. and I, yeah. I really don't enjoy yeah. doing that. Yeah. Um, something that I really like to do that um, is like <laughs> kind of celebrate that like my ideas are big enough that people don't like them because <laughs> I have aimed to be likable my whole life. Like that's been the sum total of my energy in the world was like, please like me. Hmm. And so sometimes I can bring it around to myself and be like, wow, like you're something, <laughs> there, you're something and you're someone. And so people aren't going to like it, but like, that's, that's my goal. I've been yeah. trying to do that. Yeah. So it can help me to, so I'm, I'm not really answering your RSD question. It probably is though. Cause if I'm able to pull all of these mental resources in, in the moment, I'm probably not spinning out at quite the same rate as other people might be. Yeah. So the big, like kind of one of the, like the litmus test that I use is so for normative rejection sensitivity, right. Which this is like, makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. Um, it's proportional to the criticism. For RSD, it's it's out of balance, right? So like your ability, it, it does sound like it stings and then you have an ability to come in and self-soothe. And then 
like, yeah, how long does that process take till you've released it? And it's not like in the back of your head. It can be as quick as like, as a, as a kind of a, like five minute. Oh my wow, God. That, that, that really so hurts. Nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's like, yeah. I, I'll go swing or something like that, like some kind of intense body movement and it'll move through. Sometimes it takes a couple of hours, um, but I can usually flesh it out with some really vigorous play. Um, I usually have to get really immersed in like some other part of me in order sure. to release it. Yeah. Yeah. That's really a playful nice. self. Yeah. 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 I've been experimenting with like reducing how I'm on social media or I have played around with just leaving, but I don't think I will. Um, but partly for exactly what you said about like the mental real estate of, I, I don't want that being the thing in my head. Um, but your experience does sound a bit different than mine in regards to like how long it lingers. I do a lot of that self-talk too, but it's like, I have to keep doing it because it'll keep coming back. Um, yeah. and so it's, it's the releasing takes a little bit longer for me. Oh, I'm sorry. That sounds hard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, you know, it's interesting. I have actually seen a lot of autistic advocates leave and I am not at all surprised. I understand. Um, and ADHD advocates, a lot of them, a lot of us have, I think kind of a short lifespan in, in the advocacy space, which I think is really sad. And I think is really understandable. I agree. I agree. Something I'm wrestling and struggling with right now too, is like the way that privilege intersects with all of this. And, um, it, it feels like so inescapably true that my privilege is a large part of what enables me to be the advocate that I am because of yes. all of the supports that I'm able to put in place for myself to show up this way. And also that that is then making the message itself more difficult for people to hear because yeah. it is wrapped in my own privilege. Yeah. And yet I don't want to not do it because I think of all of the people who are saying you're the only one saying this stuff, we need you to keep on going. And it's not that I'm only doing it for others. It also comes out of me right. um, and an alignment there, but, but it is, it's a, it's a complex picture to sit with. Like if someone was less privileged than I am, they wouldn't be able to withstand yeah the challenge, um, of being this kind of advocate. And so people are leaving. And so then we're losing those voices in those spaces. And yet <laughs> yeah. uh, I can't yeah. be the only voice on this or the, the message is going to get very convoluted by my own privilege. No, I, I love that you bring in that lens of privilege. Cause I, that absolutely intersects in so many profound ways. And yeah, like I was sharing my experience with someone with a ton of of privilege, um, most specifically white privilege. And I think that it is like, yeah, when I look at particularly trans autistic, autistic advocates and BIPOC autistic advocates, like the level of risk they take and the level, just, just the crap they have to deal with the terrible, terrible stuff they have to deal with. Um, I I'm, a, yeah, yeah, it is. I really appreciate the work of the people who are out there. And then when, yeah. And I feel a lot of sadness when they ultimately, many of them often have to leave for their safety or their well-being. And I think that is, says a lot about where we are in the movement and where we are in society. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. agree. And yeah. as my children move into some more vulnerable identities, it also makes me <laughs> less and less able to um, kind of, embody uh, the transparency that I want to have um, in, in protection. So there's yeah. also um, mm -hmm. just different roles that we need to occupy for the vulnerable yeah. people in our lives. Yeah, no, absolutely. I actually had, I asked Patrick to take a reel down previously because I was like, this doesn't feel sick because it was a like reel where I share a lot of my identities and we're a very neuroqueer family. I was like, this I've gotten one too many death threats around this. So can we take that off? Um, mm -hmm. And it is, especially when you're thinking about vulnerability of family. Um, yeah. Gosh, this just felt heavy, Amanda. I just like felt a wave of heaviness. Um, I feel that too. I feel that too. And I think that that's maybe, maybe it's not RSD, right? It's like yeah. 
there's nothing out of proportion here. Like this is a very proportionate reaction to the incredible yeah. risk yeah. of of being alive today in the intersection of, mm -hmm. yeah, like you said, like neuroqueerness, like it's just, it's not safe. And even those of us with tremendous privilege are still feeling just the acuteness of the unsafety. And that tells you, like you said before, like, of course, anybody who is embodying even more vulnerable identities, um, yeah, it, it just becomes unbearable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel like I'm wanting to transition us either to the end or like back, but I'm also realizing like I'm feeling the heaviness of this and like how forced of a transition that feels in this moment. Yeah. I really, I just, I want to say, I really appreciate the work you do. Cause I know, uh, I actually saw like a pretty, pretty big creator in the ADHD world, like criticize the summit that I was a part of. And, um, I think it was actually because of an infographic I made that went viral. <laughs> um, and then they were, like, they were conflating it with um, permissive parenting, which is a really shallow understanding of low-demand parenting. And I was just like, oh my gosh. I'm, like, it made me really thankful for the work you do, just realizing how I'm sure you get a lot of people who are like getting a two-second bird-eye view of what you do and making a ton of assumptions. Um, and I've had so many people work who typically are on my email list and they've heard about your resources are like, thank you so much. Amanda's work has changed our family's life. So I really, really appreciate that you are showing up even though it is a risk to our safety and it does take a lot of spoons and a lot of our resources. Yeah. Uh, I saw yesterday, somebody put up the book cover on autism inclusivity and was like, what do people think about this? And my heart just dropped. I was like, oh God, like this could be anything, you know, like, cause that, that space can be, it's great. And also, yeah, they can really be harsh. Um, oh yes. <laughs> um, and it was mostly positive. Um, but yeah, it does feel really hard. So Amanda, um, you've got fantastic resources. I know people and families have really benefited from them. Tell us where people can find you if they want to connect with you. I don't know if you're still doing one-on-one -on -one coaching or if it's mostly group coaching, but tell our listeners where to find you. I, I would love to connect. Um, the best places to find me, giving things away and sharing with the world is um, on social media, through um, Instagram and Facebook, I'm Low Demand Amanda, Low Demand Amanda. And um, I also have a quiz on my website called Why Are Things So Hard that can help um, get a sense of like what you might be up against if you're a parent and you're trying to figure out, yeah, that question, like, why, why do I feel like I'm drowning? Um, and then one next step that you can take um, to begin to get uh, either to start floating or to get a life raft out there in the deep end. Um, I also love to share um, in in groups in deeper ways about this method and about um, learning how to take care of ourselves and um, caring for neurodivergent parents is a real passion point of mine right now. So I'm running group coaching um, and I'm just starting in the next month, a mastermind group that's going over six months with live retreats where I can get um, off of the computer and into real face-to-face -face connection with, with other people um, and really designed around deep care for neurodivergent moms in particular. Um, so I feel like I'm getting closer and closer to like what my real deep purpose is in the, in the public space. I love that. And I love that you're incorporating embodied work. Every time I meet with you, even though it's all been over Zoom, like there's a, you have an embodied feel to you. So I'm not at all surprised to hear you're hosting embodied retreats. Um, I worked for about a year or a year and a half, I ran an autistic moms group. That was like one of the highlights of my month because it it is really rare to find a space where we're moms and we're not talking about our autistic children. We're talking about our experience. I, I love that you're leaning into that that right now because i there's so much need for spaces for neurodivergent parents yeah yeah i would say like people find me in the world if if you are a drowning mom thinking 
why am I messing this all up? Like you're my people because you're not, but the game is rigged. So we're going to start to (laughs) change the roles. Yes. Yes. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for coming on. I think sometime we'll have to have you on to talk about the work you actually do, which is like low demand parenting and caring for neurodivergent parents. So if we do, I know people have been asking for a parenting episode. So if we do a parenting episode, we might have you back on if if you're willing. But thank you so much for being our um, representative autistic person without ADHD. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. So um, new episodes are out every Friday on all major platforms and YouTube, and you can like, download, subscribe, and share. Thank you so much and goodbye.